Do female doctors have better outcomes compared to male doctors? A retrospective study recently uh, in April suggests that female patients have slightly better outcomes when their physicians are women. In a 2017 retrospective study, investigators found that in-hospital mortality and readmission rates were lower, an adjusted difference of about 0.5%, among patients cared for by female physicians compared to male physicians. This was done in a cohort of 750,000 Medicare patients. So obviously, as your sample size gets larger and larger, the uh, range of your confidence interval gets closer and closer, and and you feel like you have more statistical significance. So approximately 30% of patients were cared for by female physicians. Female patients had significantly lower adjusted 30-day mortality, minus 2.24%, and lower adjusted 30-day readmission rates, minus 0.48%, when they were cared for by female physicians than by male physicians. In contrast, for male patients, physician sex had no significant effect on these endpoints. So I'm very curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are on this. Do you think this is a legitimate finding, or is this maybe just some random sampling error? I'm not going to delve too much into the article itself, which is where you'd probably really be able to make that determination. But just kind of anecdotally speaking, do you feel like there is a difference in the care provided by female physicians and male physicians? I do feel like, um, at least working with my colleagues uh, who are women, I do feel like um, a lot of times they do tend to have a little bit more empathy for patients. I do think they double check their work a little bit more than I think. I think men, we tend to just, you know, just do things really quickly, just get it done real quick. But just as a general overall trend, and I I don't want to say uh, overall, I obviously I don't want to be like sexist or anything and say, you know, this is the way it is. But I do feel like women sometimes are better positions than men. So let me know what you think. So the good news is that this data was abstracted five years after the data from the original 2017 study. And the mortality differential for patients cared for by female versus male physicians seems to have narrowed in that time. The bad news is that we still see higher mortality and readmission rates among female patients who are cared for by male physicians than by female physicians. So very, very interesting finding here. This is another study that showed there were multiple studies on hospital plumbing and gram-negative bacteria. Yet another report links ICU-based Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection to contaminated sinks. A second study suggests an inexpensive intervention. And so this was a really funny one to read. Uh, but you know how there's those COVID super spreader events? Well, they're calling these sinks super splasher sinks. So the the sinks that were most implicated in transmitting highly resistant pseudomonas infections to their uh, p- to the patients in those rooms were sinks where the faucet was draining too quickly, or you know the drain wasn't letting the water out quickly enough, and so the the like droplets would like splash everywhere. And uh, there were quite a few uh, patients in. In ICUs who ended up developing multi-resistant pseudomonas infections due to these sinks, and it was linked to those very sinks, like the same bacteria was growing in that sink that was later cultured from the patient. Several studies have linked contaminated hospital wastewater systems to outbreaks of antibiotic-resistant gram-negative bacteria bacteria. In a prospective cohort study, Voling and colleagues assessed risk for sink to patient transmission of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in six ICUs for one year by analyzing Pseudomonas isolates from rectal swabs and samples from sink drains and faucets. Among 58 admissions with ICU-acquired Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 34 instances involved positive environmental isolates from the ICU room three to 14 days prior to the first positive specimen from the patient. Whole genome sequence analysis found that in five instances, Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates from the infected patient were highly related to isolates from nearby sinks. And then the second study here showed that uh, potentially slowing down the faucet flow or improving the drainage of the sink may reduce the risk of bacterial dispersal. So this is a a very, very interesting article for me. Uh, Just really makes you appreciate the fact that, man, those, those sinks... There's no real good way to clean them, right? You do your best, you can clean them, but whatever's in those pipes is still going to be there. And uh, if the bacteria wants to grow there and it wants to splash all over the place, uh, it's kind of hard to to prevent that. And so really makes you 
want to double check yourself when you're washing your hands. Make sure you don't touch anything uh, unnecessarily over there. Ultra processed food intake is associated weekly with long term mortality. So, uh, meat based ultra processed foods had the strongest association. So, ultra processed foods make up more than half of the average diet in the US and might be associated with adverse health outcomes. Investigators analyzed data from two long term perspective studies in which 110,000 US health professionals completed detailed dietary surveys every four years starting in the 1980s. Data were collected on mortality during greater than 30 years. So my big problem with nutrition studies and diet studies is that it's extremely, extremely difficult to control for any potential confounders, you know, any different, uh, you know, any multitude of different variables could be contributing to the results that they're finding. And it's very hard for people to actually self-report what they're eating. Like, do you accurately remember what you ate, you know, two days ago? Or, you know, you're doing a dietary survey every four years. Do you remember what you ate two years ago or how your diet was like two and a, two and a half, three years ago? It's going to be very hard for people to accurately detail that. And the quality of that d- data is going to be very poor, in my opinion. But uh, it is an interesting study. So, Compared with participants in the lowest quartile of ultra-processed food intake, those in the highest quartile had significantly higher all-cause mortality, a hazard ratio of 1.04, and mortality from causes other than cancer and cardiovascular disease, a hazard ratio of 1.09, but they did not have a higher incidence of cancer or cardiovascular mortality. So it's interesting. They had higher all-cause mortality, but it wasn't due to cancer or cardiac disease which is what you would probably assume with uh, you know, ultra-processed foods, you would expect the increase in mortality to be from worsening cardiovascular disease or higher rates of cancer, but that was not the case. So that begs the question, what was contributing to the higher mortality? And so again, this brings up potential confounders. So maybe the people who eat more ultra-processed foods, maybe they engage in more risk-taking behaviors or something like that, or maybe they're in more environments, you know, that, you know, could contribute to, uh, to accidents or things like that. Cause, cause what else are they passing, passing away from? It's not very clear here. So it's an interesting study. I think we all know that processed food is not good for you. Um, but I always take any nutrition studies with a grain of salt. And so basically the comment says associations between ultra processed foods and mortality generally were weak, but varied among categories of ultra processed foods, meat being the most, um, strongly associated one advice to patients probably should focus primarily on optimizing overall dietary quality with some attention to limiting meat based ultra processed foods. Does a thick liquid diet improve clinical outcomes in hospitalized patients with dementia? So all the time we have uh, patients with dysphagia or trouble swallowing, failure to thrive. And so speech therapy comes and evaluates them, says they're high aspiration risk. And so sometimes we prescribe thick liquids. And uh, interesting, I, I like the little comment they have here, but the evidence is thin at best. So dysphagia is highly prevalent in hospitalized patients with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. And these patients are often prescribed thick liquid diets as part of a dysphagia management, despite the lack of robust evidence that this intervention improves clinical outcomes. I really love this uh, format so far, by the way, I'm just going through this journal watch right now. And it is really nice to just get this like brief, you know, quick summary of the findings. And if you really wanted to delve deeper, you know, we could open up the actual article here. But I do like just having this like bite sized piece of information here uh, as well. So researchers conducted a retrospective study of patients with Alzheimer disease or other dementias who were hospitalized with clinical concern for dysphagia in 11 hospitals in New York. Uh, 4,500 patients received uh, thick liquid diets, and they were matched to 4,500 patients who received thin liquid diets. Hospital mortality was similar in the two groups. Compared with patients who received thin liquids, those who received thick liquids were significantly less likely to be intubated with an odds ratio of 0.7, but were significantly more likely to have respiratory complications, including pneumonia. So it's actually a very interesting uh, study for me because I just recently uh, had some patients where we, you know, speech recommended a thick liquid diet. And so we prescribed a thick liquid diet. But uh, looking at the risks and benefits at this point, 
you know, intubation 0.7. So it's a 30% risk of uh, intubation, but you have a 70% increased risk of pneumonia. Overall, hospital mortality was similar. So it's kind of going to be like a risk benefit and what you think or what the patient thinks uh, or at least the family thinks would be uh, more in line with the patient's goals of care. Because intubation obviously is a very severe event. Um, upgrade to the ICU, you're going to be on lines, pressors, drips, all these things. Um, and then pneumonia, you know, they didn't really define how severe it is, but it's a very significant increase in pneumonia. And so uh, this large study supports a hypothesis that thick liquids minimize the volume of aspiration, which explains the decrease in intubations. However, thick liquids also are more difficult to clear from the airway when aspiration occurs, leading to more respiratory complications. In addition, thick liquid diets are not very palatable and can result in inadequate nutrition or hydration. So uh, really, they're recommending patient-focused uh, you know, asking what the patients would prefer and, and going over the risks and benefits. But in general, seeming I've been favoring doing more liberal diets, especially in patients who are at risk for uh, aspiration or who are having failure to thrive. You know, all the time we see these patients with dementia who are on like low sodium carb controlled diets and they have like failure to thrive and they're like cachectic just because they have a prior history of diabetes and heart failure. But at this, at this point, you know, if, if a patient is that severe in their dementia, just give them a liberal diet. I mean, it improves quality of life. They need that nutrition, right? Then you want to encourage them to eat more. Um, and you know, the low sodium and, you know, I've seen patients with like hyponatremia who are on like low sodium diets. So just be more mindful of the diets that you're ordering and consider liberalizing diets when appropriate. The best and worst states for doctors to work in 2024. So in 2024, Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska are the best states for practicing medicine, while Hawaii, Rhode Island, and New Jersey are the most difficult. So basically, they compared 19 key metrics that impact the practice of medicine, including the average annual wage, the number of hospitals per capita, and the quality of the public public hospital system. And uh, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Mississippi had the highest wages adjusted for cost of living, while Washington, D.C., Hawaii, and Massachusetts had the lowest rate wages. Which is surprising to me. I always thought it was going to be like... Alaska or something, because it's kind of hard to get people out there, but um, interesting. So uh, where does your state fall on this list? So you can take a look here and you can see the best and worst states, Montana, South Dakota, Nebraska, Utah, a lot of those kind of Midwestern kind of states uh, are over here. And then uh, Texas, pretty good at 17. And we've got, uh, where's Georgia, I wonder? Georgia, 18. Wow. Okay. Pretty good. And then uh, California, a little bit towards the bottom, which makes sense. High cost of living. Um, the wage doesn't really make up for the higher cost of living. And, uh, you know, you got the stuff rounding out the end of the list, um, Hawaii, Rhode Island, things like that. But um Surprisingly, you know, 42 for Alaska, I, that was much lower than I expected. Arkansas, uh, some of those other southern states were doing very well, so I don't know why Arkansas is so low. Um, Hawaii, you know, you're paying for that, you know, with the cost of living, the reduced wage. But, uh, you know, you got that Hawaii lifestyle, that Hawaii weather, so you, you can't really go just off of this data alone, This uh, these 19 metrics. They're not talking about overall life happiness or something either, so... All right. Is diltiazem safe in patients with atrial fibrillation taking apixaban or rivaroxaban? Uh, I think uh, some of you guys actually commented on some of my videos a couple months ago asking me to take a look at this article. I'm just going to do a quick review of it here, um, but maybe at some point I'll dive a little bit deeper into these articles. But in a study of Medicare administrative claims data, diltiazem was associated with excess risk for bleeding in patients receiving, receiving apixaban or rivaroxaban. So this is actually uh, potentially a very interesting article that would be worth doing a bit of a closer journal review on. And um, basically, uh, diltiazem has inhibition of CYP3A4 um, and a weak inhibitor of P-glycoprotein, which leads to excess levels of medications metabolized by those pathways, including apixaban and rivaroxaban, so they have increased bleeding. This was done in 200,000 Medicare patients, and uh, the rate was a hazard ratio of 1.2. So it's a very interesting study and, you know, we don't tend to use diltiazem too much because a lot of patients with AFib, they also have heart failure. We don't want to give diltiazem to patients with heart failure because it increased all-cause mortality. So, um, you know, most people are on metoprolol anyways, but very interesting to know this because if you are prescribing diltiazem, 
uh, frequently, then it's good to know what some of the side effects are. So I wonder how well of a quality this study was, but uh, uh, definitely would be a little bit more cautious with prescribing diltiazem in these patients. All right, so some very interesting articles on Journal Watch that had been collected over several months that I'd just been uh, leaving in my email inbox, and then I'm finally taking a look at them now. But uh, they're kind of interesting. I, I like clicking on some of these and just seeing what some of the latest updates are. So uh, I haven't made that much use of Journal Watch before, but just doing this little exercise here kind of makes me a little bit more interested in keeping up with some of the latest uh, research and things like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Please let me know down below if there's any interesting uh, new articles that you've read recently or heard about. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching and peace.